Hey guys. Welcome to the State Department. Hope everyone had a somewhat restful and calm holiday weekend. Um, uh, a few things actually at the top and then I'll get to your questions. Uh, first of all, many of you saw the Secretary's uh, statement uh, out earlier today as well as a, a background call that we did. Uh, but I just wanted to reiterate uh, that we welcome today's announcement by the governments of Japan and the Republic of Korea uh, uh, that they have reached an agreement regarding uh, the very sensitive historical legacy uh, issue of so-called comfort women. Uh, the two governments made clear that by implementing this agreement, they will, quote, finally and irreversibly, end quote, resolve this issue between the two governments. And we believe uh, this agreement will uh, promote healing and help improve relations between uh, two of the United States' states' most important allies. Uh, we applaud the leaders of Japan and the Republic of Korea for having the courage and vision to reach this agreement, and we call on the international community to support it. Uh, also, uh, of course, all of you have seen in, uh, in the news today, uh, but I uh, wanted to note uh, uh, events in Ramadi and the fact that we can commend, rather, uh, the government of Iraq and the brave Iraqi forces uh, that have displayed such tremendous perseverance, as well as courage in the fight to return Ramadi, the capital of Anbar province, uh, back to the Iraqi people. The coalition has supported this operation every step of the way uh, with hundreds of airstrikes uh, and through our train, advise, and assist program, uh, and has assisted Iraqi uh, forces to effectively maneuver and counter ISILs uh, maneuvers and tactics uh, in this very complex environment. While there's still uh, clearly a lot of uh, work to be done to reclaim all of Ramadi and the remaining portions of Ramadi and fully secure the city, and while these operations will take time, uh, Iraqis' forces' gains uh, in the city are dealing a significant blow to ISIL and exemplify the capability of Iraqi security forces and the effect of coalition air power when working in conjunction with skilled partners on the ground. We think this is indicative uh, of the, that the strategy that we're currently pursuing is having an effect. Uh, it is uh, consistent with our national security interests. In order to address this problem over the long term, we need to build up the capacity of Iraqi forces who continue to battle to take back their country from, the, from uh, this barbaric organization. And then finally, uh, there have been a few reports about this in the news, uh, and we just issued a statement uh, in the Secretary's uh, name, uh, but I did want to speak about uh, uh, the, uh, where we are on progress towards implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action concerning Iran's nuclear program. As the Secretary made clear in his statement, Iran is taking steps, the steps it committed to take uh, to prove to the world its nuclear program is and will remain exclusively peaceful. And while we're not yet at implementation day, the steps already taken have made us and our allies safer in concrete and measurable ways. So one of the most important steps uh, occurred earlier today when a ship departed Iran for Russia uh, carrying over 25,000 pounds of low-enriched uranium materials. And this shipment alone more than triples uh, the previous, uh, our previous two to three month estimated breakout time for Iran to acquire enough weapon-grade uranium for one weapon. So this is an important piece of the technical uh, equation as it ensures uh, an eventual breakout time uh, of at least one year by implementation day. A number of countries made valuable contributions to this, uh, these, making these shipments happen. And the Secretary spoke this morning uh, with his Norwegian and Kazakh counterparts to specifically thank them for their assistance. Iran's also moving forward in removing much of its uranium enrichment infrastructure as well as removing and rendering inoperable the existing core of the Iraq reactor. The IAEA will, of course, verify all these steps and more, and the agency is continuing its own preparations to implement the extensive monitoring and verification regime of Iran's entire nuclear program, as specified in the JCPOA. We'll continue to consult closely with both the IAEA uh, and other P5 plus 1 partners uh, 
as we move toward verification by the IAEA that Iran has met all of its key nuclear commitments. We remain fully committed and on track to implement our sanctions uh, related commitments provided under the G JC pr provided for under the JCPOA. Our team is working hard to be prepared for implementation implementation day. When that day comes, the lifting of nuclear related sanctions per the G JCPOA uh, will take effect. It is not the policy of the United States uh, to prevent per permissible business activities with Iran. And finally, uh, we will continue working to ensure that the full implementation of the JCPOA achieves exactly what we set out to do from the very beginning of these negotiations, which is to ensure that Iran's nuclear program is and always remains exclusively for peaceful purposes. Well, that was a long uh, summary at the top, uh, but over to you, Arshan. Um, I'd like to start with the final item, which is yeah, the sure, Iran item. So, um, and this may be a technical thing that you can't answer, but if you can, it would be great. Yeah, Why sure. does the statement say uh, low enriched uranium materials rather than just low enriched uranium? Sure, actually, I, I think I can at least attempt to answer this. Um, so the, the, this, when we refer to it as material, it's actually a combination of forms of low enriched uranium materials. So it includes up to 5% enriched uranium and oxide forms, up to 20% uh, enriched uranium scrap metal, and partially fabricated fuel plates uh, and targets uh, containing up to 20% uh, enriched uranium. So that, that actually constitutes, I think, uh, of almost all of uh, Iran's current stockpile of enriched uranium. And second, is it your belief, uh, regardless of what the IAEA may or may not verify, is it the U.S. government's belief that, that with this shipment, Iran is now below uh, the 300 kilogram uh, threshold? Well, that's the, I mean, that's, yes, I mean, that is, so uh, this would bring Iran closer to meeting its commitment to have no more than 300 kilograms kilograms, rather, of low enriched uranium by implementation day. Um, but uh, your point notwithstanding, we will wait for the IAEA to actually uh, verify that its stockpile is 300 kilograms or less. Right. But you say this would bring it closer to meeting its We just, I, I think, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just yeah. saying that we, we're waiting for that. We'll wait for the IAEA to actually confirm that. That's so you're not going to op opine on whether it is at or below 300 kilograms? No, I mean, this would, were it in fact verified by the IAEA, I think it would bring them below the 300 kilogram threshold. But let's wait and okay. for that to. And then one more thing. I'm perplexed by one sentence. I'm asking this kind of on behalf okay. of Matt. Uh, there's this sentence in the statement that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, which is that it is not the policy of the United States to prevent permissible uh, business uh, with Iran. I mean, if it's permissible, why would it be your policy to prevent it? I, I think, point taken, look, I think it's, uh, you know, that line, uh, I was trying to address the fact that, you know, there was some uh, – confusion, consternation uh, expressed over the visa waiver program uh, legislation and whether that would affect, uh, uh, or, you know, allowable, permissible uh, travel, uh, business travel to Iran because of the fact that, um, as was uh, lay, uh, laid out in Secretary Kerry's uh, uh, letter to uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, uh, that that somehow that would dissuade uh, uh, business people from uh, Europe traveling to Iran if they would somehow not be able to have visa-free or visa waiver travel to the United States. Um, Secretary Kerry was uh, very clear in his letter saying that um, uh, those recent changes in visa requirements uh, will not in any way prevent us from meeting our JCPOA commitments. And I think I was, you know, well, not I think. I was just trying to reiterate that point. Okay, so that was actually going to be the next thing that I yeah. was going to come to because, as you will have seen, um, uh, the Iranian foreign ministry today has said that Iran will take reciprocal measures in response to any breach of the nuclear agreement. And Iran has said that it regards the law as uh, contravening the agreement. So here are so a couple of questions. One, sure. do you concur with the Iranian view that the new uh, visa restrictions or limitations contravene the nuclear agreement? We do not. Uh, you know, as again, as uh, uh, Secretary Kerry's letter made clear, uh, and uh, it was uh, 
publicly released uh, last week. Uh, but, you know, that any recent changes in visa requirements will not prevent us from meeting our JCPOA uh, commitments. Uh, you know, we'll implement the new legislation uh, so as not to interfere with uh, legitimate business interests of Iran, uh, such as in those areas where uh, sanctions will be lifted when Iran has meted its JCPOA commitments. My, my question, in yeah, a sure. way, though, goes at kind of a separate issue, yeah, which sure. is um, uh, that it won't keep you from keeping your commitments is one thing. But if the Iranians believe that you have breached or contravened the agreement, then maybe they won't and that's, meet their commitments. I mean, I mean look, Ashad, I am aware, and I, I figured that was going to be your follow-up question. You know, um, we've, we've expressed uh, our uh, conviction that this new law will not uh, in any way uh, prohibit us from fulfilling our commitments to the JCPOA. Um, I can't speak to uh, what Iranians, uh, what Iranian politicians may be saying about this or not. Uh, I would just say, this, uh, you know, the Secretary's words and language stand. Uh, you know, we have a number of potential tools uh, to ensure this new legislation does not uh, unduly interfere with JCPOA's implementation or legitimate business travel. And we've talked a little bit about that before. I think uh, John spoke to it last week. Uh, you know, there's not a bar to uh, B1, B2, uh, non-immigrant visa travel, uh, if it were to come to that. And there's also other uh, tools or, or uh, possibilities on the on the table that we can uh, work around. Thanks. Yeah, can please. Can we go Iraq? Can we go to Iraq? Of course. Okay. Uh, first of all, can you confirm? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you still want That's fine. Let's finish up with Iraq. Yeah. Ultimately, of course, um, implementation day will be determined by when the IAEI verifies that Iran is in compliance. But with this development today, um, do world powers have a sense of, or even sort of a rough outline on when implementation, implement, implementation day may occur? Um, does this perhaps make it foreseeable um, in January or February, as um, Iran has alluded to recently? Sure. Um, I, I'm, uh, so, I, you know, obviously by my lengthy readout at the top of the briefing, uh, we do believe this is a significant uh, step in that direction. Uh, I would hate to put a date certain on implementation day, uh, except to say that Iraq still has uh, a number of, uh, of steps it needs to take, and I think I spoke to that about the Iraq uh, reactor site uh, and some other uh, um, uh, some other uh, steps it needs to take, obviously, uh, to get to implementation day. But certainly, uh, you know, the removal of nearly all of its stockpile of in low enriched uranium, uh, once it's uh, certainly confirmed by the IAEA, is a significant step. And certainly also because of what I just mentioned, which is that it, uh, this action alone will increase uh, Iraq's breakout time to achieve a nuclear weapon from at what it currently at two to three months to uh, a year or more. So it's a significant step. I just, I, you know, there's other steps that need to be taken, certainly, but uh, but this is uh, uh, obviously a significant one. Seriously. Can we go to Iraq? We can go to Iraq. Okay. Uh, first, can you confirm uh, that uh, Shishani, who is the field commander in Ramadi, was captured? Can you confirm that? I cannot or? confirm that. No, I, I've you, seen those reports. Seen, I just don't know. You've yet. seen those reports. Now, uh, also, we're a bit confused on the exact status of uh, Ramadi. The government of Iraq has said that it has been totally liberated. Uh, other reports say that there are still some uh, in the surrounding areas. And yeah. in fact, uh, ISIS fighters have been able to flee north, which I cannot imagine. I mean, I know the area. So yeah. do, you, do you have any? I, I don't. Uh, you know, I know um, uh, Colonel Steve Warren, who's in uh, Baghdad, has given a little bit uh, uh, more operational details on this, but even, you know, he recognizes and has recognized, and we do as well, that, um, you know, uh, as you clear a city, and certainly you know this site from your experience in Iraq, uh, it's not, uh, it, it, it takes a while to get there. You need to, uh, obviously, there's always pockets of resistance. Uh, there are areas that need to be cleared. Um, you know, the, the Iraqi national flag is once again flying over Ramadi. That's a significant uh, step forward, but there's going to be uh, uh, still, as I said, pockets of resistance as Iraqi troops move to clean up uh, the city and now, secure uh, it. on the role of uh, U.S. Yeah. advisors 
uh, and military advisors, mm -hmm. were they involved uh, in any way in operational activities? Sure, just, uh, I mean, I can give you some right. some numbers. Uh, you know, 17 members of the coalition uh, joined the U.S. in deploying uh, military personnel uh, to assist the Iraqi government in training uh, along, with, uh, along with advise and assist missions. Uh, 12 coalition members uh, con uh, have conducted over 6,000 airstrikes uh, um, in Iraq, including uh, 630 alone in support of the Ramadi operation. Uh, 19 coalition members provided uh, supported air, supporting aircraft, including transport surveillance uh, and aerial refuelers. Uh, so there was a lot of support, a lot of active uh, air support provided to the Iraqi troops uh, who, uh, who retook the city. But your specific question was? My specific question is on the, you know, the ground forces, the uh, U.S. Uh, special forces that are sure with the Iraqis uh, were they involved in any way in combat did they call in let's say air yeah I mean you know uh, I'd really leave that for the Pentagon to talk about uh, what their operational role was but it, it would be expected that they in fact called in you know precise or precision bombardment and so on well generally on speaking ground. you know that's what we've talked about in some of these forces on the ground who can actually bring in close air support um, but I don't want to uh, necessarily speak to what their role might have been I, I think it's better addressed by the Pentagon please um, yeah, we'll stay with Iraq and then. Okay. Yeah, sure, that's okay. Uh, Iraqi Parliament Security and Defense Committee chairman said that uh, U.S. has landed airborne troops to a county near Kirkuk over the weekend. I was wondering if you can confirm this or deny. You said uh, 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 U.S. airborne troops are landed in Iraq, Kirkuk. That's what he said over the weekend. No, I've no. I, I haven't even seen those reports. I apologize. I don't have anything for you on that. Pam, is it still Iraq? Yes, staying with them. Okay, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. Staying with Ramadi, um, a couple of questions actually. Okay. Um, the first one, looking a little ways down the road to what would be the next step, are there initial plans um, that are ready to be put in place for the stabilization and reconstruction of Ramadi? And um, if not, could Iraqis ho hold Ramadi without such a plan? Well, I, I do, uh, yes. I mean, I think, obviously, when, whenever we talk about liberating uh, cities uh, or territory from ISIL, uh, you know, the next step is obviously uh, uh, re um, recreating stability there so that people can b come back, uh, those refugees, those people who have been displaced by the fighting uh, with ISIL uh, can return home. Uh, so that's obviously going to be a, a major um, uh, initiative uh, going forward. Um, just looking to see if I have any uh, specific numbers on that, but uh, but I know we are uh, uh, giving the Iraqi government uh, uh, some funding uh, to help assist with those uh, stability operations. Um, you know, as I said, that's you know um, that's always the the one-two punch, if you will. I mean, once you uh, retake this territory, you've got to get uh, stability returned. Uh, you've got to get a uh, an interim government or a, uh, or a government up and functioning. You got to get services restored. Uh, uh, otherwise, as, as you point out, uh, you know, people who've been displaced or frankly, people who've been affected by the fighting uh, cannot uh, return to normal lives. Businesses can't return, economy can't return. Uh, so you need to, re absolutely, you need to get those basic services returned and stability provided. And then one more on the same yeah, topic. Um, what about the reconciliation talks that involve the Sudis? Um, how important are those talks to help stabilize the region? And, and then what's the status of those? I don't have a status report. Uh, you know, obviously, we've talked a little bit about them before. They are important. Uh, I'll see if I can get a, an update for you on those talks. So, yeah. If you are an Iraqi Sunni in Anbar province, which has been the site of extreme violence over the last dozen years, why should you have any confidence that a Shia-dominated Iraqi federal government will protect you and create a stable environment in which for, for sure. you to live? Well, I think, um, you know, look, this is something uh, Prime Minister Abadi has spoken to, has spoken about uh, uh, numerous times um, in his own agenda to include Anbari leaders in uh, the decision-making process, uh, the plan to liberate Ramadi, uh, 
and the governor of Anbar was uh, also and played an important role in recruiting Sunni volunteers, uh, boosting police training, uh, coordinating military operations, et cetera. Um, but it's absolutely important, as I said, uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Abadi spoken to this, is, you know, uh, this needs to be an inclusive governmental approach. Uh, and now is the time where, you know, um, uh, the proof is in the pudding. So he needs to, you know, the Iraqi government, Iraqi armed forces uh, need to show that they're actually committed to that process. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's let this uh, uh, move forward. Certainly uh, the last uh, week has brought significant gains uh, in uh, returning seized territory uh, back to the Iraqi people. But as I said to, uh, in, in response to Pam, now the, the second part of this very hard uh, process uh, uh, comes into play, which is creating an environment where all people can return to their homes. And can you um, <clears throat> can you uh, take the question of what funding you may I will. be providing? I have it somewhere and in this immense book, and I'm sorry. No, 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 don't worry. But the, the related question to that is that the U.S. government has spent uh, quite a lot of money in Iraq over quite a long period of time to try to promote stability. Um, whatever those numbers are, I suspect they will be significantly lower than the amounts that were spent in the early 2000s. Um, why should anyone believe that U.S. money uh, will be decisive or significant or even influential at all in the, in, in the current circumstance when the money spent in the past well, you know, didn't uh, necessarily maintain sure. stability? Sure. I mean, a couple of thoughts on that, uh, uh, Arshad. I mean, I you know, without having the, the figure, exact figure in front of me. Um, you know, this has been an iterative process uh, and in, in many respects, uh, on, certainly on our part, uh, learning how to effectively uh, work with local governments, local leadership uh, to bring back stability, to uh, create uh, security uh, and a secure environment uh, for uh, the local populations but also on the part of the Iraqi government. It's a different Iraqi government now, one that has pledged to be more inclusive, more diverse, uh, and uh, more democratic, uh, and uh, more mindful of uh, making uh, uh, or creating a country that, in which all of its citizens uh, can live uh, in peace and security. So, you know, part of that is that it's a critical mindset to achieve. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, we'll certainly, um, as I said, the proof is in the pudding, but. Uh, what we've seen thus far on the part of uh, Prime Minister Abadi and his government has been a real effort to change the, um, the paradigm. Uh, Mark, can yeah, I sure. follow up on something that uh, Pam raised on the issue of uh, the displaced refugees? I mean, it's upward of 200,000 people yeah. fled uh, Ramadi. Now, you said something that I'm not clear on. You said that you need to have an interim government in place. I, I, mean, I, I meant okay. to, I typically meant like authorities, local Sorry, authorities. Okay, but, but the My governor, apologies, I the misspoke. The council is there. You guys have worked very well yep. with them in the past. They yep. are in place. So yep. that, there's uh, a local government. Facilitate because uh, I'm talking about. Sorry, just to yeah. just to elaborate. I, right. Thank you for calling me out. <laughs> right. Right. What I'm talking about is you know for territory that has been liberated, you know, territory that was under ISIL control. It's important, and this is not just true for Iraq, it's true in any uh, situation, similar situation, where you've got a void. You need to get uh, basic services returned, local government reestablished, so that there is a safe and secure environment for people to return to. That's simply the point I was making. Are, are we likely to see a direct U.S. Uh, effort to bring in the people back? Since there is, a, you know, not much a great not a lot of goodwill between the, the, the population sure. and, the, and the central government. Will the United States, because it has worked in the past with these tribes, with the, the leaders of these tribes and so on, will you work directly to bring the people back? I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm hesitant to, to speak directly to that. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a direct role. Uh, I'm sure that we're advising and assisting wherever uh, feasible and possible uh, the Iraqi government in how to do that. Um, but as I said, this is an Iraqi government that's been very clear that it's uh, that it wants to create a more inclusive environment, and so uh, we'll certainly help how we can for it to achieve that. We uh, we we now in South Korea? Uh, South Korea? Yeah, yeah, the comfort women sure. issue. Uh, as you mentioned, Japan and South Korea just have reached agreement over comfort women issue. Yeah. Uh, Japanese uh, government will give about $8.3 million dollars to fund to who they suffered during the Second World War. But it seems some people, some victims are not satisfied with that. Uh, 
comfort women called Lee Yung Su uh, requested Japan's uh, damages for war crime rather than conciliatory compensation. So, uh, how does the United States make sure the uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's right wing politicians and advisors will not damage the agreement by provocative statements in future? Sure. Um, well, uh, again, uh, these are issues, uh, and as I said at the top of the briefing, um, you know we certainly applaud uh, the efforts of both governments to reach this agreement. It was not an easy uh, thing to achieve, uh, and took, uh, uh, as I said, uh, courage, hard work, uh, perseverance on both sides to come to an agreement. Um, I'm aware, uh, as we all are, uh, that there are uh, continued uh, grievances. People who feel aggrieved. Uh, 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 even with this agreement, uh, that's really for uh, the government of South Korea, working with its own citizens, th those affected by uh, by these events, uh, to work with them uh, to uh, address their concerns. Uh, and certainly, on the same, uh, in answer to your question, in response to your question, uh, you know, it's incumbent on the government of Japan uh, to. Uh, uh, to sell this agreement or to uh, uh, convince uh, the Japanese people uh, that this agreement is in the best interest of Japan. So h historians estimate it's up to 200,000 comfort women during the Second World War. They are not only from South Korea, but also from maybe China, Philippines, other countries around the world. So um, do you think Japan should have the same kind of attitude towards them or kind of save, same kind of apology? to these other countries come for women? Sure. Um, again, that's, uh, you know, uh, this is an important agreement, significant step forward in addressing some of these, uh, uh, as I said, very sensitive uh, historical issues. Uh, we stated many times uh, the United States uh, that the trafficking of women for sexual purposes um, by the Japanese military during World War II uh, was a terrible, egregious uh, violation of human rights. Um, we do believe this agreement today will help uh, he promote healing and help improve relations, certainly between uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea. And we believe that that will help uh, address, again, some of these ongoing, I'm just saying, let me finish. So that's going to help, I, I apologize, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just trying to finish my answer, which is, you know, does this agreement answer all of the uh, remaining grievances? No. Uh, in the region? No. It's an important step forward, though, and it's an important step forward by Japan. So what other things Japan should do next? You mean I'm not going to uh, uh, attempt to tell Japan or the Japanese government uh, what it should do next. Uh, it's an important agreement today. Uh, it's a step forward. Uh, it's up to Japan to address uh, the way forward from here. So during this process, American, the United States, make some pressure on Japanese government to, I mean, make this happen, right? So so very clear on that point. Uh, this was a process that was initiated, led by uh, the two governments. Uh, you know, the United States uh, has been very clear all along, remains clear, that uh, we supported this process. And that <coughs> support uh, was conveyed uh, at a variety of levels, from Secretary of State Kerry, from the President. Uh, on down to lower levels of our government, but certainly it was a consistent message that we believe this was a worthwhile process to pursue and one that would ultimately help uh, alleviate uh, tension and, and uh, create a better environment um, uh, uh, in the future uh, between, as I said, two of our most important allies. Just a follow-up on that? Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, so in terms of selling the deal, I mean, <laughs> it seems pretty significant that the victims themselves have already, some of the victims at least, have come out and spoken against the deal. I mean, isn't it a concern that you're, that the two governments are not including the actual victims in these negotiations or these discussions? Again, I think, you know, it's for the governments, and, and these are two democracies, um, it's for them to address, as we would, you know, here in the United States in a similar situation, attempt to address the concerns uh, of our own citizens uh, and hear their concerns and listen to them and try to respond to them. That's part of the democratic process. Um, so I'm not going to speak on behalf of 
the Japanese or the Korean government in terms of what they need to do to address their own citizens' concerns on both sides of this issue. And I'm aware that this is, as I said, a very sensitive uh, historical issue uh, and that, you know, uh, this agreement will not uh, necessarily uh, answer or appease everyone's concerns going forward. But that said, we do support this agreement as a way forward to, to heal this wound. Please. Syria? Can I follow up on that? Yeah, please. Um, on the same day, Japanese First Lady actually just uh, visited Yasukuni Shrine. Um, first of all, do you have any comment on that? And isn't that ironic to you that on one hand, Japan is apologizing, and on the other hand, the First Lady just to visit the um, Yasukuni Shrine. Um, do you doubt Japan's sincerity on their apology? We've no reason to uh, uh, doubt. Uh, we've no reason to doubt uh, Japan's sincerity. Sincerity, rather, um, uh, and I don't have any information about her uh, visit uh, to the shrine, um, but we don't believe it in any way pertains to or affects. Uh, uh, their sincerity regarding this agreement. And also, um, I know you, um, the senior official mentioned in the uh, sure. conference call, I wonder if you can address that, how important is this um, resolution in terms, of, um, in terms of the U.S. rebalance to Asia strategy? Well, as I said, um, you know, this was a, a source of ongoing tension, uh, to put it mildly, between two of our most important allies in the region. So in that respect, we do believe it's a significant step forward uh, in a process to heal uh, some of those uh, uh, some of those wounds from the past. Uh, so in that regard, yes, we do uh, think it's important. Uh, as I said, Japan and the Republic of Korea are uh, stalwart allies, economic partners. Uh, so anything that uh, that uh, moves them closer, we believe, benefits the region and certainly the U.S. Please. Syria? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, let's finish can I get up. a couple for Japan? Of course. Yeah, sorry. So, um, That's okay. related to that, um, you know, within the United States over the years, activists have pushed for building monuments and pushing for legislation and local politics. Um, and now, with this agreement in place, does the administration, you know, how, what is the administration's position on this politicizing of this comfort women issue within the United States? Within the United States, uh, you know, again, this is a. Uh, as I said, a very uh, painful uh, historical issue. Uh, you know, I, I sp spoke to that. The secretary spoke to it in his statement. Uh, sensitive historical legacy issues. Uh, and so, you know, there's going to be difficult emotions, uh, hard feelings. Uh, by no means are we trying to say that this agreement is going to convince everyone as of tomorrow, that all is, uh, that we've moved on or moved past this. And certainly it's the rights, as I said before, talking about J Japanese and, uh, and Korean uh, democracies, that it's the right of citizens to express their concerns, their grievances, uh, and to uh, ask their government uh, to address them. That's, that's part of the process. So I'm not going to say we're uh, going to disregard in any way or, or, or take those uh, concerns, ongoing concerns, lightly. Uh, but we do believe this is a significant step forward to address some of those concerns. And, um, well, the statement that Secretary Clinton released earlier yeah. talked yeah. about, you know, calling on the international community to support this yeah. agreement. Does that extend to citizens within the United States, you know, those activists in Korean American communities as well, to support this agreement? We would hope that, uh, that citizens, uh, that all people feel that this is an agreement that, uh, as I said, that uh, moves uh, forward, that is forward-looking, uh, that can help, as I said, uh, uh, resolve what has been a, a painful historical legacy. Um, within the agreement, it mentioned that uh, both countries would not use the issue, uh, bring them up in international uh, fora, including the UN. Um, do you think that that would include bringing up the issue as a, a teachable moment in history, learning from this mistake in the past? Would that would just issue just be off limits for discussion in the future? Um, again, that's really for the, the, the two governments to uh, uh, to speak to who signed the agreement. But, I mean, the U.S. brings up, for example, uh, the Holocaust or the Rwanda genocide as, as examples in history that we can learn from. Do you think the U.S. would uh, 
you know, use the comfort women issue as uh, uh, an example in history in which we can address future uh, sexual violence during war? Sure. Um, I mean, it's a fair question. I, I don't want to hypothesize or, uh, or speak to hypotheticals. Uh, um, you know, uh, again, I think that um, we hope this agreement will serve as a demonstration of the fact that uh, two countries can put uh, painful historical legacies in the past and move forward. Please. Syria? Yep. Over the weekend, uh, one of the uh, strongest Syrian uh, rebel leaders, Zahran Alush, got killed. Sure. Uh, apparently, he was one of those who signed the Riyadh Agreement uh, just a few weeks ago. How do you view this uh, attack uh, by the Assad regime or the Russian Russians? Yeah, you're talking about uh, Zahran Alush, right? Uh, yes. Um, well. Uh, First of all, the United States uh, provides no support to Jaish al-Islam. Uh, and we have significant concerns about uh, the group's behavior on the battlefield. That said, Jaish al-Islam uh, has supported a political process to end the conflict and has fought against ISIL. Uh, they were also a participant in uh, the Riyadh conference, as you mentioned, uh, of the Syrian opposition, which has been a key step forward in efforts uh, to work toward a resumption of negotiations and a political path uh, to end the conflict. Uh, so the strike on Alush and others in Jaish al Islam and other opposition groups do, in fact, uh, complicate efforts uh, to bring about meaningful political negotiations. And, uh, and, a, and a nationwide ceasefire. Uh, we need progress on both these efforts in the coming weeks. Okay. And Syria, too? Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Arshad, and then over to you, Mike. Yeah. You're the leader of a, uh, of a militant group that has, as you pointed out, supported a political process, fought ISIL, and taken part in the Riyadh talks, which are explicitly designed to bring about a dialogue between uh, opposition groups and rebel forces that are willing to do so and that you approve of, and the Syrian government. And then somebody, whether it's the Syrian government, the Russians, or somebody else, then kills the leader of one of these groups. Why should anybody in any of those groups think it's a worthwhile endeavor to engage in, uh, in such a process? Why shouldn't they just fight it out on the ground? Well, um, first of all, uh, I think we would agree uh, that uh, it doesn't send the most uh, constructive message uh, to carry out a strike like that. Um, and as I said, it complicates those efforts. Uh, it is our hope that these strikes uh, don't reverse any progress that we've made and we'll certainly continue to encourage uh, the opposition to fully participate in this process. Uh, we support uh, Stefan uh, Di Mastura's uh, timetable, uh, the, the, and I think he has a target date of January 25th to begin uh, the next, or the process, the political process. Um, so uh, my answer to you is I hope it does not. We would hope it does not discourage these people from participating in the process because we need uh, to begin efforts right away to reach an agreement uh, that leads to a genuine political transition. And just as an addendum to that, I would say that uh, this has been a, a brutal uh, fight over the past now almost five years uh, that has not brought any kind of peace or stability or resolution or way forward. So I think everyone recognizes, certainly those who are immersed in this fight, uh, would recognize that there's no uh, military solution to this conflict. Uh, does that involve taking risks? Certainly. Uh, but, uh, um, but we believe a political process is the only way to move forward. And have yeah. you conveyed uh, either directly to the Russians or directly or indirectly to the Syrian government uh, 
essentially what you Our just concerns. your concerns about this particular strike and the possibility that other strikes could derail the yeah. political process. Rashad, I don't have a, 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 a concrete answer. Um, I, I know that there have been conversations had. I just don't know whether that was specifically brought up in that direct way. I'll try to get you an answer. Then. Thanks. Yeah, Michael. Um, Reuters reported today, based, based on a number of several U.S. officials, that at three months into the campaign, Russia's involvement has helped stabilize Assad, has made him, in, uh, has put him in a position safer than he was three months ago. Uh, is that what you're seeing? Do you feel that Assad has been more stabilized by um, uh, Russian involvement? Sure, uh, Michael. You know, in, in uh, I'm always wary of uh, uh, affirming or disputing, uh, you know, uh, uh, anonymous or uh, unnamed sources uh, from the U.S. government. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who those people are. I don't know what their assessments are. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say anything differently than we said a week or a month ago, which is that, uh, you know, Russia has, by its actions, put itself in a very precarious place uh, in terms of supporting a government that has brutalized its own people, its own citizens, that represents a minority uh, of the population. And we would hope, uh, and certainly it's something we've been working, and in some respects working constructively with Russia, to put in place a political process that can address that core issue so that we can all turn our attention uh, to fighting ISIL and so that we can bring some measure of stability and peace back to uh, Syria. But from your, yeah, from, your ahead, vantage yeah, point, sure. from your vantage point, do you see signs that there's more stability there, that he's stronger, uh, the Syrian government over the past as you know, opposed to three sure. months ago. I, I think that, you know, I mean, look, Russia has, uh, Russia's presence, and we've been very clear about this. Uh, we Do we believe Russia can play a constructive role in Syria? Yes. Uh, do we believe that its uh, operations or strikes up till now uh, have done that? Uh, it's arguable that it has done that, and we've said that because it's been hitting some of these Syrian opposition groups that have been fighting uh, Assad. Uh, it's been carrying out strikes against these moderate Syrian opposition. Uh, uh, it may well be hitting uh, ISIL targets. Uh, that may be the case. Um, but this is a very complex environment. And what we need, as we've talked about a lot uh, here, uh, is you know we need a, a two-pronged effort. Uh, one is to bring a political resolution to uh, the conflict between the Assad's regime and the, the moderate Syrian opposition. And then the other is to address ISIL uh, and, and its... Uh, its actions and pursuit of territory and territorial gains in Syria. Uh, so we've got to do one to address the other. Uh, we're working on a, a process going forward. Uh, and as I said, Russia has played a, a helpful role in that process. Mark, yes. That, you know, Sorry, I'm very congested. When you I apologize. To Isis, you refer to Assad. You say he represents a minority. You're not suggesting that that minority ought not be represented, are you? No, no, certainly not. I'm just saying, I apologize. Okay. But what we said, and the secretary has. No, no, no. I'm saying that right. we need an inclusive. Right. What he what he has, and, and others have spoken about this as well, mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, the, the the preponderance of his uh, actions, brutality, whatever you call it, against his own citizens have been. Uh, I, I understand fully, but you know, you have many minorities of that course. actually look to us. Of course, and, and we've been. Many of course, and we have many, been very clear. You know, right. Well, wait a second. So right. I want to be very clear that we don't believe right. that. President Assad is a legitimate uh, uh, leader uh, for the, the kind of Syria that uh, we support, that Russia says it supports, that the other members of the SSG support, and that other Syrians say they support, which is an inclusive, sovereign, uh, non-sectarian country. Please. Uh, Russia's deputy foreign minister said that uh, Russia and U.S. have uh, common understanding on groups which should be considered as terrorist in the Middle East. Russia and the United States. The United States has a common understanding on groups which should be considered as terrorist ones in the Middle East. Uh, I was wondering if you guys have any list together with the Russians who are terrorists and who are not fighting in Syria, and considering that uh, the Russia is targeting some of the groups in Syria which the United sure. States uh, well, refers I, I, as a moderate opposition. So without seeing the uh, direct quote, uh, what I believe he is trying to say or what he may be pointing to is the fact that we do agree on some groups that we believe are not part of uh, 
in any way, shape, or form Syria's political future, uh, namely al-Nusra as well as ISIL. Um, there are a lot of other groups out there, uh, we acknowledge that, that not just us in Russia disagree on, but other members of the ISSG, uh, the International Serious Support Group, uh, disagree on. That's part of this process. Is it easy? No, it's very difficult. Where, these, where we come down on these groups, how we get there, how do we get to a common collective of quote unquote moderate Syrian opposition who can then take part in this political uh, process that leads towards a transition. Uh, that's all part of the hard work in front of us. We do have agreement on some of these, we don't have agreement on others. And one last one on yeah, Russia. Uh, there are reports arguing that Russia is uh, cooperating with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, in fact, uh, Russia foreign minister spokeswoman said that the contact between Moscow and the Afghan Taliban only involves intelligence sharing and information exchange regarding the fight against ISIL. So I was wondering how do you see this Taliban and Russia sure. relations? Um, well, I'd refer you to the Russian government. Uh, you know, Russia and other regional actors uh, all have a shared interest in supporting continued security uh, and increased stability in Afghanistan. Uh, we certainly hope we can find ways to work with Russia to promote Afghanistan's uh, security and stability. But I don't have a specific comment to those reports. Okay. Let's, stay with Let's stay with Syria. Syria's foreign minister said his government is ready to take part in the UN-led talks on um, a political transition. Has the U.S. received word on who will represent the Syrian government? And then secondly, um, is it your understanding um, that the ISSG will be present for those talks in Geneva, or will it be just the government, the opposition, and the UN? Um, all very good uh, questions. Uh, on the first part, um, no, we don't. I, I don't believe we we know who uh, the Syrian government is proposing uh, take part in those uh, those talks. Uh, on the second part. Um, I frankly don't have the answer. Uh, I'll have to. And you're talking about the Demistura uh, right. talks. Uh -huh. um, uh, that is a UN-led process, um, so I'm not certain that any of the ISSG would, uh, any any members of the ISSG would would be there. Uh, I'd have to. I'll have to get uh, clarity on that. One final one on Syria. Just a couple questions ago, Mark, you talk about how the peace and stability has not come to Syria, whereas today. Apparently, there is a, a blog post on State State Department by John Kirby. It has been discussed on the social media all day. And uh, one of the pivotal moments of 2015 is Kirby states bringing peace, security to Syria. Sure. Uh, could you expand on that? Is uh, Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy that you read uh, John Kirby's uh, blog posts. Uh, that's encouraging. Um, now look, um, you know, the operative word there is bringing, not brought. Um, so we're bringing peace and security uh, to Syria. I think that is a truthful claim. Uh, there has been significant process, we believe, uh, in the past year on both fronts. Progress. What's that? Process or progress? I, I think both. I mean, I think the, I think progress on a process. Um, I don't think anyone would say that we are there or across the finish line. And if that was conveyed in any way, that that's a mistaken impression. Um, but you know, three months ago, the Syrian opposition uh, was not unified around a common uh, set of negotiating principles. Now they are. Uh, three months ago, uh, the international community was not unified around a common understanding of what a successful political process or transition could look like. Now they are. And three months ago, there was no UN Security Council resolution, or consensus rather, on Syria, uh, much less a mandate to create, implement, and monitor a ceasefire. And now there is. We would cite all of those as progress. We're not there yet. We recognize that. But we do believe, uh, through a lot of hard diplomatic spade work, that we have made progress. Can you move to the Afghan Israeli issue very quickly? Are we done with Syria? We're done okay, with good. Syria. Yeah, let's do very it. Very quickly. No, no, get to uh, that. Today, today. No, no, that's okay. What were you asking me about? Um, yeah, the Israeli apologies. group uh, Peace Now uh, issued a report saying that uh, the Israeli government is, um, is, is basically giving permits to about 50,000 new housing units. He's saying that uh, they're saying that uh, eight of these, 8,000 of these homes will be built in E1 area, others in Bizgat Zaib, and so on. They, 
they are quite detailed. And in fact, they are calling on the U.S. government to pressure or do whatever it can to have uh, sure. Mr. Netanyahu rescind uh, his decision. Do you, can you share with I'm us? Not, I apologize, uh, yeah. Said. I'm not, uh, not aware of the specific uh, uh, allegations or, the, or reports, but this NGO is making are, are certainly our – uh, our position or policy on settlements hasn't changed, but I'll have to look more specifically at some of these claims. Okay, we'll yep. look to do it. I'll ask you tomorrow. A absolutely. So. Thanks. Sorry. Please, sir. On, on, on Cuba, could Cuba. you just talk sure. about your ambitions for the coming year? And is it is it an aspiration that before he leaves office, the president will visit Cuba <laughs> as a great sort of symbolic moment? Is that something you're working towards? I, I would certainly, um, you know, uh, look. I mean, you know, Cuba was another. The restoration of our diplomatic uh, relations with Cuba was a very significant event of uh, 2015. Um, uh, you know, recognizing, uh, of course, that, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, on the human rights front, on multiple fronts, uh, uh, to build that relation, strengthen that relationship. Um, but we recognize, as I said, and the President and Secretary spoke to this, that, you know, uh, after 50 years of a, a certain policy of isolation, uh, that that was getting us nowhere. Uh, but, you know, there is uh, a lot of work to be done. As to the President's travel plans, uh, I would never uh, speak uh, uh, or attempt to speak uh, uh, on behalf of uh, his, uh, his travel plans. Um, but as I said, there needs to be a lot. There still needs to be, a, or there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, uh, uh, others have spoken to this uh, uh, in the last, uh, I guess it was the, uh, the one year anniversary, I guess, of this uh, announcement of the change in policy. Uh, but uh, there have been, as I said, uh, significant, uh, there has been significant process. Uh, just when I was looking here on December 16th, of course, we had the United States and Cuba uh, reach a bilateral agreement to establish scheduled air services uh, between the United States and Cuba. Uh, you know, one of the things we were very clear about on when we did announce this reestablishment of diplomatic relations, the reason why we were doing it was to uh, establish that people-to-people -people contact with the Cubans, and, uh, and through that, we feel that we can uh, make great strides. Uh, and uh, by getting them greater access to information, greater access to, uh, 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 to uh, well, information, business, uh, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, we do want to see the embargo lifted. We've been very clear about that. That, that rests with Congress to do. Um, you know, but uh, it's going to take some time, I guess is my <laughs> short answer, not so short answer. Please, China. Do you have any comments on the uh, Chinese anti-terrorism law, which just passed yesterday? Sure. Um, uh, right. Uh, well, uh, first off, uh, we do condemn, of course, all forms of terrorism, regardless of the political or other goals professed by their perpetrators. Uh, however, the United States uh, remains concerned uh, that the broad, vaguely phrased provisions and definitions in this law speaking about uh, the counterterrorism law, could lead to greater restrictions on the exercise of freedoms, freedoms of expression, association, uh, peaceful assembly, and religion within, within China. Uh, so we're continuing to examine the final text of the law, uh, and uh, we'll continue to make our concerns uh, known to the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese foreign ministry was saying this legislation was rolled out in accordance with the needs of reality and also the latest situation. So if the goal of this law is to make China safer, you know, um, less no mass shooting, less terrorism-inspired attack in China, isn't that something that the United States should at least pay respect? Well, I said, I mean, we obviously condemn all forms of terrorism. We recognize, uh, you know, as we do, governments uh, throughout the world uh, wrestle with uh, how to confront uh, the challenge of terrorism uh, while at the same time maintaining uh, democratic norms and freedoms uh, of, their, of their people. Uh, you know, that is an essential struggle uh, uh, inherent, I think, uh, uh, to confronting terrorism. Uh, you know, but as I said, we're, we are concerned when uh, we 
believe certain laws overreach uh, and could lead, again, could lead to greater restrictions uh, on the exercise of freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly. So that's our concern. And we'll continue to, you know, this is a conversation we obviously, as you all know, have uh, with China, and we'll continue to have that. And do you still uh, have the previous concern, which is focused on the, um, the backdoor access to foreign comp internet company and phone company's data? Um, because that item was um, reading in the draft, but left out in the final version. It was left out in the final version, mm -hmm. right. I, I'm aware of that. I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I haven't, as I said, we're still looking through the law. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly that was a concern. Uh, you know, any access, again, this is, as I said before, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a struggle that many countries around the world face in confronting terrorism. Uh, you know, how do you balance privacy, uh, freedom of expression, all of those elements uh, with the need to provide national security or protect your people? Uh, and, you know, that is uh, something that, uh, uh, we hope that uh, uh, China also struggles and seeks to uh, try to address as it moves forward with this law and implementation of this law. But isn't the U.S. government also ha doing the same thing? Because China argues that the, um, China studied the U.K., the U.S. similar legislation, and the U.S. government actually also has backdoor access to your companies. So isn't the U.S. holding um, double standard on sure. this issue? Um, again, I'd have to I'd, I'd have to look at what the the final law reads uh, and uh, and look at our own laws, um, but I think I tried to address that at least in the in by saying that you know this is a dynamic that we see many countries facing, uh, but uh, all countries need to do the utmost to ensure that uh, that their citizens, while protected, still are allowed to freely express themselves, have access to information, etc. Uh, yeah, can we one more question, Pam, and then. Burundi's government and opposition yeah. began talks today on resolving the political violence. Um, how optimistic is the U.S. that the um, talks will have the desired result? Um, well, we think today's reopening of uh, this dialogue, regionally mediated dialogue, uh, between parties to the Burundi crisis is an important yet preliminary step uh, towards putting Burundi back on the road to peace. I think it's imperative that all Burundians renounce violence and intimidation and support peaceful, productive engagement in dialogue as a key to reestablishing in Burundi an atmosphere of openness and trust. And we certainly appreciate the efforts of the government of Uganda as well as President uh, Museveni in hosting today's session in Entebbe. Thanks. Thanks, guys.